Okay, I want to talk about how Charles Darwin developed his ideas. Because Darwin didn't just pull his ideas out of nowhere. He didn't just create them from nothing. Darwin was a product of a whole bunch of cultural uh, influences and a, and a sort of stew of ideas coming out of the Enlightenment that helped him to produce his theory of evolution. And, and part of the reason we know that is that somebody else, Alfred Wallace, developed almost an identical theory of evolution a few years after Darwin and before Darwin had published his book. And so it was actually Wallace showing up at Dar or sending Darwin a, a letter and saying, hey, what do you think of my idea? that pushed Darwin to actually finish Origin of the Species and publish it. So if two people come up with the same idea in, you know, at the same time, you know that that's a real cultural influence there that's, that's creating that. So let's look at some of the influences that Darwin uh, was surrounded by. Um, now, first of all, I want to point out that beginning in about the 1600s with the Scientific Revolution, people began to question you know, where did human beings come from, um, you know, what, what did, how old is the earth, all, all those sorts of things. Um, but at that time, the standard answer that everyone just sort of assumed was that human being, or not that human beings, but that the earth and human beings had been created as narrated in the book of Genesis in the Bible. Um, and, and that was just sort of accepted partly because of the authority of the Bible and partly because there wasn't a better explanation. But this had a number of implications um, for people who were trying to explain human origins. And, and, you know, one is that the Bible implied that the earth was young, right? Because the Bible gives the creation narrative and it gives you Adam and Eve. And then it has a genealogy that's traceable this person was the father, this person was the father, this person, down to Jesus. And Jesus is actually a dateable person in the sense that we have, we have a pretty good idea when he lived. And so, in, in fact, in the late 1600s, a, a, an Irish bishop named Usher um, actually uh, tried to calculate the exact age of the earth using the Bible. And so he, he very carefully traced the genealogy and he figured out which people had ages listed in the Bible and for how long they lived. And he came up with the answer that the earth was created in 4004 BC. Now, other people didn't agree with Usher's calculations, but that was about the framework, right? And so anybody who wanted to explain human origins had to explain how human beings come to be within, you know, 6,000 years, you know, 5,500 years um, from 4004 BC up till whenever you're talking about trying to figure it out. Um, and, and we'll see that this was actually a seriously shaped scientist thinking, even in the 1700s, um, scientists talking about the origin of different human races were trying to figure out, you know, what, if, if human races had diverged from Adam, and they, they really said it had to be, it, it, God must have created different races or, or not, because how could they have changed in just 6,000 years, right? And so this very short time frame created a real limitation on what sorts of ideas you could come up with. Um, a second issue that people had to think about was, you know, obviously the Bible says God created human beings exactly as they were, but scientists in the 1700s began to ask, you know, they began, they began to ask some questions that were troubling and led them to wonder about human origins. And, and so there was a couple of things to show. First of all, European uh, scientists began to become aware of the fact that there were fossils of animals, like dinosaurs, creatures that clearly were not alive anymore, that, that had gone extinct. Um, and so Europeans had to explain, well, how do we explain this, that there were animals before that aren't there now? Now, in the biblical narrative, this is a problem because the medieval Europeans had said that God had created the earth exactly as he wanted it. And so why would he allow something to go extinct? Did he make a mistake? Right? Um, and, and so that idea was really anathema to medieval Christians and was still part of European culture in the, in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, was this idea that, that God doesn't make mistakes and extinction implies that God made a mistake somehow. And so if you wanted to, you know, explain this extinction, this is a problem, right? So a lot of scientists began to wonder, 
well, maybe there's something else going on here besides the biblical narrative. Um, in, in addition, you know, some of these big dinosaur skeletons, how do they fit on the ark, right? Um, and so uh, the second issue, of course, uh, that, that comes up, not of course, but uh, was, was that scientists began to really study comparative anatomy. They began to look at the at bodies, dissect the bodies of animals and dissect human beings, and they began to really look carefully at what some of the similarities were. And a number of scientists began to notice that there were a lot of similarities in terms of the number of bones in the hands of all sorts of different animals. And the, and, and the internal organs seemed very similar in a lot of different animals, especially mammals. Um, and they began to ask a lot of questions about that, like, why are there so many similarities? And, and also, you know, they began to ask some strange questions like, well, you know, if you look at a horse's hoof, the horse actually has all the bones in, a, in, a, in its ankle and its hoof that, that other mammals do. It's just that most of the bones have shrunken down to just being, you know, little uh, tiny remnants of, of what they used to be. And the horse's hoof is actually basically uh, one finger that the horse, the, you know, with, the, with this enormous nail on the end of it, basically, um, that the horse runs on. But why does it have those other bones, right? Um, and so they began to ask these very, you know, tricky questions. And, and one, one thinker in particular, um, a scientist, um, the Comte de Buffon uh, in France, was a, was a really careful comparative anatomist. And he, he really, he came very close to suggesting that evolution had happened, right? He came very close to saying, you know, human beings probably evolved from some common ancestor with apes and other things like that. He published his multi-volume uh, natural history of the of, of, bio, of the biological world, and in it he he kept coming really close to saying exactly this that humans had evolved. But he, he whenever he ran into the censor and they're like you can't say that he's like oh I didn't mean that I, I in a issue of retraction. But then his next volume would do something else that would come very close. And Buffon was part of a larger group of people, a, a network of scientists and friends in the 1700s who who, who met at the salon of Baron Holbach. Uh, in Paris, and, and these include people like Diderot, and Rousseau went for quite a while, and Hume showed up for a while, um, and Holbach was there, and Helvetius showed up once in a while, um, and Buffon was there quite frequently. And these guys generally questioned everything. They, they really were very hostile to religion. They thought Christianity was actually a, a force for, for evil in the world, and they, they, they thought atheism was the way to go, and they had a sort of scientific mindset. And they really chewed on the idea of how can we explain human where human beings came from without God, right? And because they really wanted to do that, and and but they they recognized there were two problems. The first is the time problem that I just talked about. That everybody assumed the Earth was still six thousand years old, and that does not give you much time to develop human beings, right? By any any slow process. Instead, human beings just had to come into existence. And if that's the case, how do you explain that without God, right? But the second was that they didn't have a mechanism. They, they really realized, and in, in the writings of someone like Diderot, you can really see this, um, they, they really struggled with how to explain how inert matter could think, right? Um, how, and and how, could, um, how could this have emerged? Human beings are obviously very carefully put together and in, in, intricate in their design and all these different parts doing very specialized roles. How does that happen without an intelligence designing it, right? And so they didn't, and, and they didn't really have a mechanism to explain how that would happen. Now, in spite of that, they, they still tried. And, and in fact, one sort of wrong answer uh, came from René Lamarck, who was a French scientist. Uh, in the early 1800s, uh, Lamarck came up with the idea, he actually published a book and claimed that human beings and all other animals had evolved over time. But the mechanism he gave was actually what's called acquired traits. He thought that if an animal or a human being or whatever did a certain thing over and over, its body would adapt to that activity. And, but then he thought that you could acquire, that, that that trait that the animal had acquired over its lifetime would actually transfer to future generations. And so he thought, for instance, that if some gazelle or something on the African savanna was stretching up for leaves on trees and stretching and stretching, it would stretch its neck over the course of its lifetime. And then when it had children, the children have longer necks. And hence, he, you know, you could explain the giraffe, right? Um, 
Now, that's not actually how it works biologically, but this is one of the first shots that anyone had taken. It's seriously trying to scientifically explain how evolution could happen. So he tried to come up with a mechanism through acquired traits, uh, which is not a good mechanism because it would, you know, if, if that was the case, Arnold Schwarzenegger's kids would have come out totally buff, um, and, and that's not what happens, right? So by the early 1800s then, the idea of evolution is, <coughs> is circulating in the air, in particular, I mean, Dar Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, um, was a big proponent of evolution. He couldn't explain how it happened. He didn't have the mechanism, um, and, and the time problem was still not entirely solved <coughs> in the late 1700s, early 1800s when Darwin was writing. But he, he was fairly confident that evolution was a real thing, um, and he was fairly confident you didn't need God to explain uh, evolution. Um, but it still remained that nobody really had the mechanism and the time problem was still there. So I want to talk now, you know, and, and so Darwin is, is, is reading all this, you know, reading all these debates. He's reading his Diderot and his Holbach and whatever. Um, who knows what he was reading, but, um, but Darwin was, was aware of a lot of this. He came from a very educated family. Um, and, but we can really point to several people who helped Darwin to solve these two problems, the time problem and the mechanism problem. Um, the first is I want to talk about a, a geologist named Lyell. Uh, Lyell was, uh, was a major figure in geology, and he wrote several books that came out right when Darwin was sailing on the Beagle and, and first doing the research that would lead him to the theory of evolution. In fact, he took Lyell's book on the Beagle. Um, Lyell was a geologist. And now geology had started back in the 1600s when, when people started to notice that there were layers in the earth and they started to ask, well, what is, what's that about? And, and scientists began to sort of develop this theory that, that there were changes happening all the time in the landscape, that, you know, the, that erosion was happening, the volcanoes were, were erupting, and, and all sorts of things were happening in the landscape. And so they began to try to explain the shape of the natural world, the mountains and valleys and rivers and things, through natural processes. Now, they, one of the early debates that scientists had but in the 1700s, geologists had, was, was whether uh, one group said that if you look at something like the, you know, the, the Grand Canyon, which they didn't know about in the 1700s, but go with me on this. Uh, if you look at something like the Grand Canyon, you would say that, that, that's an enormous you know, thing, and how could that have come? And, and they said it, it must have had some violent force to cause the Grand Canyon, right? And so, so they, they would argue that, um, that some enormous monumental force must have caused the Grand Canyon or caused the Alps or caused the Himalayas or, or, or what have you, um, and that those forces aren't around anymore. And so, for instance, they, they would argue that maybe it was the flood in the Bible that caused a lot of the landforms that we see around us, and, and the, the, those waters are gone, right? God made them disappear, so we don't have to explain them. We'd have to say some huge force before caused it. But there were other people who said, no, no let's not assume a bunch of forces we can't see, and that, you know, let's not assume things were different in the past. This group called the Uniformitarian said, let's assume that the forces shaping the earth in the past are the same as the forces shaping the earth now, that the forces shaping the earth are uniform over time. And, and Lyle fell into this camp. He was very much a Uniformitarian. And so he argued that if you want to explain geology, you have to look at the forces that are happening now, erosion and, uh, and, and you know, um, volcanism and, and those sorts of things, and you have to explain everything through that. Well, the uniformitarians, of course, realize that that means you need a lot of time, right? Because something like erosion is not happening fast. You can't erode the Grand Canyon in 6,000 years. Um, and so the uniformitarians began to really push the, 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 the age of the Earth back. And they began to say the Earth is much older than we think it uh, was. And, and so by the early 1800s, geologists are starting to say the Earth might be millions of years old. And this allows the biologists to then say, oh, we've got more time. right? So Darwin now has more time. And in addition, one subtle thing about the uniformitarians is Darwin is really impressed with Lyle's book. And he, he was a good friend of Lyle's later in life. Um, 
And, and he, was, he was struck by this idea that very small forces like erosion, working over long periods of time, can bring about massive changes. And so Darwin really s starts thinking about this in these terms that, oh, well, maybe I need to think about a subtle process that's working over long periods of time to create evolution. All right, so Lyell is an important influence on Darwin. A second one was Thomas Malthus. And Malthus was a, a minister uh, who wrote in the 1790s, and, and Darwin had read him in, at, uh, in, in college, and then he read him again after he came back from the Beagle and he was formulating his theory of evolution. He returned to Malthus, and because Malthus had given him an interesting idea. Now Malthus, of course, had, was, was, Malthus was a pessimist. He had been very, he was disgusted by all the optimism of the Enlightenment saying, you know, the Enlightenment was saying science is going to fix everything and human life will be wonderful. And, um, and you know, Malthus is, is like, no, uh, that, that's not how it's going to work. And so Malthus had come up with this explanation. He basically said, um, he said, look at human, human beings. He said, human food supply is based on the amount of land they have. If you have X number of acres, each acre is going to produce X amount of you know, bushels of wheat or whatever. And so if you want more wheat, you have to add more acres. And you can simply, you know, the only way to get more food is to add more acres. And so the human food supply goes up gradually depending on how much land they have under cultivation. And it's a simple matter of addition. Every acre adds this much food. And so if you wanted to, to, to graph, you know, here's the number of acres and here's the amount of food, it's pretty much a straight graph, right? A straight line. But human population doesn't work like that because human population can grow exponentially, which means that you suppose you have, you know, suppose every generation um, has four, four times as many kids as the previous generation. And that's not actually that far off um, for most of, of human history, a rough estimate and it varies from time to place, time and place. But um, but eight eight children per adult woman is not unusual, right? And so um, uh, two people having eight kids, you know, that's multiplying by four. So that means if you start with Adam and Eve, you got two people. The next generation you have, you know, the next generation then has has eight eight people, and then you know the next generation has sixty four, and then you know. And, and it starts to grow exponentially and get big in a hurry. Well, Malthus said, basically, if your food supply is just getting growing at a steady rate and the population is, grow is growing like that, you're gonna, there's going to be a point at which the population zooms past the food supply and then you're going to have a population crash. Most people are going to die out. Right? And, and we know this actually happens. There have been some, some weird natural experiments where, uh, for instance, there was an island in Alaska where the U.S. Navy uh, introduced caribou and they, they thrived for a while, but then the po population crashed because they basically, the population got big enough that they ate all the food in the middle of winter and there was nothing left and most of them died, right? like 95% of them. So Malthus was right, this does happen, but that's not the message that Darwin got from Malthus. Because the thing that Darwin got from Malthus, which is kind of interesting, Malthus just wanted us to realize that humans are doomed to suffering here on Earth. But Darwin said, you know, it's kind of interesting because biologists often focus on competition between species, right? Hawks are trying to catch squirrels and squirrels are trying to escape from hawks and, and you know, squirrels are trying to eat food that, that rabbits also eat or something like that. And so the, the biologists had been focusing on competition between species. But Darwin reads Malthus and he says, you know what? There's competition within species. Individuals of the same species are competing with each other for the same food supply. And, and Malthus had shown him that, that there would be moments where that competition is intense, where all the individuals in a, in a species are competing for a limited food supply. And so Darwin starts to realize that this might be a key for explaining evolution, right? And of course we know later that Darwin uh, took exactly that and he, he said that if you, if you get random variations between in a population, when it comes down, when push comes to shove and there's a short food supply, one individual might have some adaptation slightly better than another individual, which would explain why they survive and they don't. Um, and so from Malthus, Darwin gets this idea of intraspecies competition, especially for food supply, that might select 
and get rid of those who are less able to survive. Final emphasis, uh, the final influence is, is Adam Smith, and you know Adam Smith, of course, wrote the uh, the Wealth of Nations in the 1770s, um, and and he was uh, a major figure in the founding of the field of economics, and and he's seen as sort of a father of capitalism because Adam Smith talked about laissez-faire markets, free market system uh, with open competition. And Smith argued that if every individual in an economy was going for their own self-interest, it actually made the whole economy to generate more wealth and become more efficient. And so it was good for the whole, even if each individual is not actually working for the whole. Um, and, and Smith talked about this invisible hand shaping things. And, and Darwin read Smith at, at Cambridge. We know that he he, uh, he mentioned reading him, um, and so, and clearly, if you look at you know, there's a lot of parallels between the ultimate theory of capitalism and the ultimate theory of of natural selection and Darwinism. Um, in, in this idea that competition is constantly favoring those who, who have some slight advantage, be it an inherited advantage in Darwin or an innovative advantage in capitalism. Um, but both of them talk about a sort of general uh, change over time because of this competition. right? And so you can see that Darwin actually, he, he had taken chunks from different thinkers like Lyle, Malthus and Smith, and he had put them together into this new theory of evolution through natural selection. And so it wasn't that Darwin just pulled this out of nowhere. Darwin very clearly had a lot of ideas that were in the air in his, in his culture that he then put together into some radical new whole.